Whichever the two of these you're actually going ahead to learn, it's useful to learn both together. They complement each other really well. So a good way to think of formal charge and oxidation states is we're going to be looking at the electrons in a, in a compound or in an atom or ion or whatever, but we're going to be looking at them from two different perspectives. So formal charge is good to think of in the everybody gets a trophy state. Whereas oxidation states we want to think of as being more winners and losers. There's a first place and there's a second place. Let's go ahead and look at those two analyses using those two philosophies. So here we have a whole bunch of different things we could have. Hydrofluoric acid, carbon monoxide, hydrogen gas, sodium hydride, and then C3H8. Maybe we'll do a couple more examples after that. But I want to go ahead and look at the everybody gets a trophy and oxidation state uh, winners and losers kind of sequence of these. So we're going to color code this in blue and red. So when I'm looking at a hydrofluoric acid, the actual molecular structure of that would be this. So it would be hydrogen bonded to a fluorine, and I would have six more valence electrons, three sets of three pairs of electrons around the point. So when I'm doing formal charge, and I'm saying that everybody gets a participation trophy, what I'm doing is I'm saying that these two electrons, I want to assign them to either the hydrogen or the fluorine. And the way that I do that is we share everything equally no matter what. So one of these electrons counts towards the hydrogen, one of these electrons counts towards the fluorine, and then we compare that to how many valence electrons they typically have. So of these two electrons here, if we kind of replace this bond in formal charge land, what we would say is we would say, okay, one of those comes to the fluorine and one of those goes to the hydrogen. We kind of split everything up equally so that everybody gets something. Okay. So for a formal charge perspective, for this molecule, what we'd say is that fluorine then has seven valence electrons represented from a formal charge standpoint, and it should have seven valence electrons. So it has a formal charge of zero for the fluorine. And then the hydrogen has one valence electron, which is what it typically has as well. So then it has also a formal charge, or zero formal charge. Whereas in the oxidation state, we don't do that. So in the oxidation state, same molecule, we do winners and losers. So to, just, to figure out which one's the winner and the loser, we say, which of these is the more electronegative of the two atoms? So fluorine being more electronegative, we say, well, then fluorine gets assigned all of the electrons. All eight belong to fluorine. So then when we go ahead and count out, the fluorine then has one extra, so it has a one minus oxidation state. It's got one more valence electron than it would typically or traditionally have. Whereas the hydrogen has zero electrons assigned to it because it's the big loser here, and therefore it gets a plus one oxidation state. Okay. Now if we look at carbon monoxide, we have a carbon triple bond to an oxygen, lone pair, lone pair. So if we were to do formal charge analysis on this, what we do is we would take these six electrons here and kind of cut them right down the middle, three for the carbon, three for the oxygen. So when we go to assign formal charge, we say, okay, the carbon has one, two, three, four, five electrons, and it normally has four valence electrons. So this has one additional electron, which gives the carbon a minus one formal charge. The oxygen, on the other hand, has also five valence electrons assigned to it in formal charge. One, two, three, four, five. And therefore, instead of six, so it would have a plus one formal charge. Now note that as we're doing these, that both of these are always going to account for all the electrons of the molecule. So if it's a neutral molecule, the total of all the formal charges will be zero, as well as the total of all the oxidation states. If it has a charge to it, the, the formal charges and oxidation states will add up to that charge. Now, if we look at this from an oxidation state perspective, then when we go through and look at this, we say, well, hold on, one of these two is our winner, one of these is our loser. So instead of sharing everything equal, everybody gets a participation trophy, what we say is we say, okay, well, oxygen's more electronegative than carbon, so I'm gonna assign every electron to be at the, with the oxygen. So now I've got two, four, six, eight electrons here. That gives this a minus two oxidation state. And I've got two electrons here when I should have four, so this gets a plus two oxidation state. Okay. Now, if I have a situation where I have H2, obviously here that would split down the middle and we would end up with, so I'm going to color code that. So we would split and we'd have one electron here and one electron here. Both of those would get assigned a formal charge of zero. For oxidation states, when you have two of the same things, then you consider that a tie, and in that particular case then, there's no reason to say that one is preferential over the other. Both of those would get assigned a oxidation state of zero. Okay. Uh, 
Now, sodium and hydride, I don't actually want to get into the exact bonding mechanism. It's ionic, so I don't want to misrepresent that with a covalent bond. Um, so let's not even look at the formal charge. But I did want to point that out with regards to oxidation states, because in this case, the hydrogen is more electronegative than the sodium. So if we represent this as a covalent bond, basically what we're saying there, sorry, let me color code that correctly, is that the hydrogen would get the electrons in this case. Now, in the past, we've seen them split, and we've seen hydrogen lose, but this would be a case where hydrogen is more electronegative than its counterpart, and therefore it would get the minus one oxidation state, and the sodium would get the plus one. So if you've ever been presented this, you've often seen oxidation states presented as a set of rules. Hydrogen is usually plus one with the following exceptions. If it's a neutral molecule, it's zero with the following exceptions or something to that effect. Um, and then oxygen is minus two with the following exceptions. But if you actually want to trace through it from its origins, oxidation state is defined by splitting up the electrons where the more electronegative atom in each bond gets assigned all of those electrons. In the case of a tie, they split evenly. And so the way the rules are what they are can be derived from this kind of exploration. Fluorine will always be minus one unless fluorine is bonded to itself, in which case it will be zero. Oxygen is the second most electronegative, so unless oxygen is bonded to itself somehow in a peroxide or superoxide or oxygen or ozone, it's going to be minus two unless it's bonded to fluorine, right? And then from there you get more and more exceptions as you move further and further away from that from that center of electronegativity. When you move to the other side, you also have seen exceptions. Sodium is always plus one, potassium is always plus one, calcium is always plus two, because those are the lowest electronegativity. So unless you're seeing some kind of alloy bonding or something, even like this, it's still the same situation. So sodium is always plus one. Um, really, this could be sodium with a plus one charge and hydrogen with a minus one charge, probably be a better representation. But anyway, let's move on to C3H8, because this is an interesting case. So in C3H8, if you go through and do the rules, you'll get some interesting things for this. But if you go through and do the whole molecule, you'll kind of see why this comes out the way that it is. So a lot of people, when they do oxidation states for something like this, will go through and say, okay, well, hydrogen is plus one. I have eight of those, that's plus eight total. So the total of my three carbons must be minus eight. So each one must be minus eight thirds. And then all of a sudden that doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, if we come at this from a formal charge perspective, we would have a tie here, a tie here, and we would split everything else as well. So really, just kind of split everywhere. So here, we've got four electrons for the carbon, that's assigned to zero. Four electrons for this carbon, we get it as a zero. Four electrons for this, and that also has a zero. And then each hydrogen has one electron, when it should have one valence electron, so each hydrogen also gets zero formal charge. So we have no formal charge anywhere in this particular molecule. However, when we do the same molecule with regards to oxidation states, we see a different picture because now we're going to be assigning some winners and losers. So carbon and hydrogen, carbon is more electronegative. So anytime we have a carbon bonded to a hydrogen, we're gonna see that differently than if we have a carbon bonded to a carbon. So carbon bonded to carbon splits, splits. But then here, carbon would get all of those electrons. This carbon would get these electrons and these electrons, and this carbon would get all of those electrons. So every hydrogen in here is plus one. But then the carbons, this carbon, when we go through and count, we've got two, four, five, six electrons. This has a minus two oxidation state, but this one has two, four, six, seven electrons, and therefore has a minus three. This one also has two, four, six, seven electrons and a minus three. So these two carbons and this one average out to be minus eight thirds, but really these two carbons are electronically different than this one. And if you go on to organic chemistry, there's a tremendous difference between carbons where it's a, um, a primary carbon like this or a secondary carbon like this. And so therefore this actually is a really good exercise in kind of getting into well, why is this carbon so different? You know, it has a greater uh, amount of electron density in here. So, so that's kind of the process of how you assign formal charges and oxidation states. Um, but really, so instead of just doing the rules, it's good to actually go through the process and go, all right, I actually want to assign based on what this thing is next to. You can even do hypotheticals where you go through and assign, like say like an A is bonded to B, we, and we know A is more electronegative. How will the oxidation states come out on that? Um, and it's really interesting to take this perspective and then go through and actually go through and look at why the rules are what they are, why fluorine gets listed first, why oxygen is usually second or third. 
So what are they actually useful for? So formal charge is usually good for evaluating, sorry, I'm switching my colors, evaluating the quality of a Lewis structure. So usually when we're looking at formal charge, we're looking to see, you know, is there a large concentration of negative charge or positive charge somewhere in this molecule that would explain its reactivity or explain why it doesn't react in a certain way. Oxidation states are usually used to track where electrons are. So this we usually use in organic chemistry and bonding. This we usually use in redox chemistry and electrochemistry. So in this case, we're looking at, you know, can I create an electrical current out of a set of chemicals? They're looking at um, where will the electrons go to or move from in this particular reaction? What's getting reduced and oxidized? What's a good oxidizing agent? What's a good reducing agent? This one's more, in this particular structure, what kind of resonance will I see? Um, will that create a deficiency of positive charge or negative charge here? So let's look at an example of that. So starting with sulfate. So when I'm looking at sulfate, it turns out there are multiple structures possible. There's a bunch. So if you do it using the octet rule, you would come up with this. But if we go through and assign formal charges on that, we've got a sulfur that's got four electrons when it should have six. That's a two plus formal charge. We've got oxygens with seven electrons where they should have six. And so I've got four negative charge centers with a two plus charge. And so what, what happens is I just have so much negative charge surrounding a positive charge, it's so unlikely that some of that negative charge wouldn't come in. So let's look at an alternative structure. We could take these two electrons and form a double bond, these two electrons and form a double bond and end up with two double bonds and two single bonds. It looks like this. And right, let's go ahead and see if we can speed this process up a little bit here. There we go. So now when we go through and do a formal charge analysis, we end up with zero, zero, and zero, minus one, minus one. Okay. Note that in both cases, we add up to a total of two minus. Okay, 2 plus and 4 minus, 2 minus and 0. But in this case, our formal charge is much better in the fact that we have not set up a bunch of negative charge directly adjacent to positive charge. Uh, now in this one, we satisfy the octet rule, so maybe that's worth something. Um, but this Lewis structure in terms of charge makes a little bit more sense. Okay, so we can use formal charge to evaluate the actual Lewis structures and kind of come up with some ideas about them. Now in the second part, I've written out an equation. And this, I actually want to do oxidation states. So here I want to go through and start assigning. So I've got sulfur and oxygen. Oxygen's more electronegative. So I can go ahead and assign my minus two oxidation state to oxygen. Total of minus eight. So in order to add up to two minus, I need a plus six oxidation state for the sulfur. Okay. Now if we look at these structures in the winner loser category, the sulfur is going to lose. So it has no valence electrons. Should have six. That's the plus six. Each oxygen is going to have eight, and that's regardless of which Lewis structure you look at. That's not going to change. Okay. Now, if I go to sulfate, now all of a sudden I've got three oxygens, which are each minus two, so that's a total of minus six for oxidation states. So the sulfur must be plus four in order for this to total up to be a, a minus two overall. So now what we can see happening is that the sulfur is changing its oxidation state. Well, what I can do to describe that is I can say that means that the sulfur now has more electron density around it than before. So it's picked up on electrons. So what I can do with that is I can now say, oh, you know what, I could use this to create electricity um, or, or as part of a battery or something to that effect. And I can talk about what's, what's going on in terms of oxidation reduction. So we would say the sulfur is being reduced because its oxidation state decreases, which means that it's gained electrons. And so, so we can also look at the reverse reaction, turning a sulfite into a sulfate, in which case the sulfur would be oxidized and would lose electron density. Um, but we can go ahead and do analysis of that that further gets into that redox realm. Okay. And we can do the same thing here. Uh, this is without the charges. I can go ahead and quickly assign these. So the sodium would be a plus one, uh, oxygen would be a minus two, plus one and minus two. So if we look at the sulfur here, this has to be plus six. So that we get plus eight and minus eight. And here we need this to be plus four if you're not doing situations like this where you're doing ions and solutions yet.
So that's a good rundown of the difference between formal charge and oxidation numbers. At this point, you can go back and actually look through to see um, what the rules are on assigning oxidation states and formal charge. Uh, but that should make a lot more sense when you look at those rules, and it should make a lot more sense when you're actually doing applications in this.